Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining with us this Wednesday evening for our midweek Bible study. Our speaker this evening will be Pastor Victor Maxwell and the subject of teaching under consideration will be the role of deacons. We have greatly enjoyed and benefited from our brother's ministry over this past month. Our brother Victor will be back with us again on Sunday to bring the word of God to us. And then next Wednesday at our Bible study, uh, when the subject will be the role of elders. Remember and pray much regarding the AGM, which is scheduled for the 25th of March, and that will take place in the church building at 7.30. And COVID restrictions will apply. Remember also that this is the week of prayer for CEF, and further details can be found on the church Facebook page. Pray much for Jennifer and for all the boys and girls that many will be one for the Lord. Remember those connected to your fellowship who are not well at this time and those who need the Lord. There will be a time of prayer after this meeting uh, and that is via Zoom. That can be accessed via the church website by clicking on prayer group 1 or prayer group 3 button. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we can approach Thy throne of grace and in through the worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee for that new and living way that has been opened up, that way that has been made accessible by the blood of Christ. Our Father, we thank Thee that Thou didst ever send Thine only well-beloved Son into this world to save sinners. And our Father, we thank Thee for the day and hour that we trusted in Him and we were saved and born again and we have peace with God and a knowledge of sins forgiven. Our Father, we thank Thee for all the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. We thank Thee, Lord, that He was born sinless, that He did no sin, and He could not sin. We thank Thee for every step He took, for every word He spoke, for every miracle He did. And we thank Thee, Lord, that uh, almost 2,000 years ago, He bore His cross outside the walls of Jerusalem, and suffered and died, and paid the supreme sacrifice. Our Father, we thank Thee that it is a sacrifice with which Thou art well pleased. And our Father, we pray, Lord, that You would bless us for His sake. Our Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. And we thank Thee for uh, our brother, Victor Maxwell, who has made the effort uh, to teach us on these very important subjects. And our Father, we pray that You will bless the message uh, and it will be uh, God-glorifying. Father, we know, that you, we know that Your Word will not return to You void but will accomplish the purpose to which you have sent it. So, Father, touch our hearts, guide us, and instruct us, we pray. Uh, for we ask it in the name that has all authority, the name that has all victory, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good evening, friends at Lima Valley. Nice to be with you on a Wednesday evening. Travelling all over the countryside and not leaving home is, is quite a thing. This evening I'm reading the scriptures in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Last week we were encouraging leaders in the promises given to Joshua. And thank God we can stand on those great and precious promises. Well, I've been invited to address the matter of deacons and then God willing next week we'll be looking at the role of elders. But for our reading this evening we're going to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and begin our reading at verse 8. 1st Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree, and a great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar 
and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on to the Gentiles, and believed on in the world, received up into glory. And amen, God always blesses to us the reading of his sacred word. Our Lord Jesus, as you know, was born in Bethlehem, had to flee as a baby to Egypt, but then returned to the city of Nazareth, the, Nazareth, the city where he was brought up. It was in Nazareth that he was known as the son of the carpenter, and sometimes he was called a carpenter. Now, if you've, if you've ever been to Nazareth, you'll know that there's not a lot of wood there, not a lot of trees there, uh, but the word carpenter really was a builder, Jesus the builder. I say that because building is not uncommon with our Lord. The Bible reminds us at the beginning of John's Gospel, all things were created by him. That means he built the universe. <laughs> what a mighty work that is when we think of the sun and the moon, the stars, the planets, this massive universe. He built it, created it, upholds it. Uh, he is a mighty builder. He built the first home. He's the one who brought Adam and Eve together, bound them together, blessed them together. And the Bible reminds us in Psalm 127, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. He built a home. Do I need to remind you on this evening that he's the builder of the church? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The builder, the universe, the home, the church. And what can we say about heaven? Why, he has gone to prepare a place for us. However, I mentioned all of that this evening because when we come to think of the church, it is his building, his structure. As a matter of fact, the Bible reminds us over there in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22 that you are the building of God, fitly joined together for a habitation of God by his Holy Spirit. My friend, can I say that all of us are as living stones joined together. We depend on each other. Just as in the body, every member is part of the other. So it is in this building. Now, I say that this evening because as you look at the New Testament, you will find that God who gave gifts to his people, remember it's to some he gave elders and others administrations and some evangelists for the equipping of the saints the teaching of the church the reaching of the world he has given gifts to all of us so it is when it comes to the structure of the church if you look over there in philippians chapter 1 and verse 1 paul writing to that uh, church in philippi why well, he said to them and let me just find it in chapter 1 of Philippians and verse 1 Paul and Timotheus servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons the, the saints the bishops the shepherds and the deacons the servants that is the structure of the church the church of the living God of which we have been reading here in 1 Timothy, why it is composed of the fellowship of the saints. We are the family of God. Hebrew, or rather Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13 says, For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of the whole family of God. We belong to the family of God. But in that family, why there is membership and there is leadership. Membership are the saints. We are fitly joined together. The leadership, why we find them here, the shepherds and the servants. And uh, can I say the Bible addresses all of these when it comes to 1 Timothy chapter 3, why the first seven verses are dealing with the role of elders. The next uh, six verses are dealing with the role of deacons. And then when we come to verse 15, we find that Paul says this, Addressing all of the saints uh, in Ephesus, uh, he says, But if I tarry, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself 
in the house of God. And that's to members and to deacons and to elders. The, the, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. To membership, why he is telling us that we belong to that house, belong to that family. And there are just three things to underline. We're not going to dwell on these. But it's interesting that he calls the, the church the house of God. Now, it's not speaking of the material fabric of your building. He's speaking of the, of the people. You are the church. The house of God, as we've already quoted, Ephesians 2, verse 22, a, a building fitly joined together for the habitation of God by his Holy Spirit. It is the house of God. Not only the house of God, it reminds us here in verse 15, um, which is a church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The living God, it's the life of God. What makes a church different from other bodies that meet together is simply this, that the living God is in the midst of the church. Zephaniah 3.15 reminds us that the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save, he will uh, delight in his love, rest in his love, rejoice over you with singing. When we read the book of the Revelation, where is our Lord Jesus? He's right there in the midst of the church. He is the living God. And the life of God is the life of the church. It is the church of God, as Peter wrote, or rather Paul wrote to the Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. So it, it, you are the house of God. We enjoy the life of God. Listen, we have the truth of God. Look at what it says here. The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. This is St. Patrick's Day. And when we think of St. Patrick's Day, we remember the Irish man who said, On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other rocks are sham rocks. My friend, can I say that's where we are? The pillar and ground of truth. The pillar. It's interesting that Paul was writing to Timothy in Ephesus. Ephesus, the city was known for the Temple of Diana, a magnificent structure. 127 pillars, each one given by a king, each one studded with precious stones. And the, the attraction of Ephesus was this magnificent temple. My friend, can I say that in God's eyes, the temple is a temple of the Holy Spirit, the, the house of God, the pillar of truth. What a wonderful thing. And we are responsible for the upholding of the truth of God. That's the function of the church. We are both light and salt in the world. Uh, not only a pillar, but the ground, that is the, the, the buttress of truth. Remember Paul writing to the Corinthians, told them, Other foundation can no man lay, save that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. It is on him that we are built. When Jesus said, On this rock I will build my church, it's the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Therefore, membership. We are members of the family of God in the house of God, uh, enjoying the, the, the life of God and holding the truth of God, membership. However, the Apostle Paul, uh, earlier in the chapter, addresses leadership in the church and everything rises and falls on leadership. That's true not just of a church, it's true in a family. That is why the Bible in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, has so much to say to us about family life, about husband, wife, about children, about our, our work. Uh, you will find that in the preceding verses, that is uh, verses 3 through to verse 13, uh, verse 1 rather of chapter 3 through verse 13, it, it, while it's addressing deacons and uh, sorry, elders and deacons, there are some overlapping qualities there that should be underlined. Uh, first of all, he's speaking of the area of our, our service for Christ. It is in the church, in the home, and in the world. If you like, it's looking at their, their spiritual life in the church, standing in the church. It's looking at their personal life in the home. It's looking at their secular life in the world. What is interesting when it comes to speak of leadership in the church 
it is not so much speaking about the duties that we perform. Rather, it's dealing with the character that we are. We must be. Be is the operative word. You see, God is more interested in what you are than what you do. What you do is important. But in God's eyes, what is important, according to this portion of Scripture, is what you are. And therefore, the whole emphasis here is put on, on character, on being a man of God, in whatever office God has called you to. Speaking of that office, uh, Paul opens this chapter speaking of the dignity of the office. My friend, can I say to be uh, called to be an elder, to be invited to be a deacon is such an honour. Why we, we don't just serve the church, we serve the Lord Christ. He is our head and we're, we're serving him. That's the dignity. But there are also the duties. And what I suggest to you, as you look down through these duties, we've got to apply diligence so that we do a good work. Interesting, in First Timothy, uh, he mentioned the word good some 19 times. Isn't that amazing? He speaks of a good warfare, of, of being uh, a good soldier in 2 Timothy chapter 2, of being a good workman, of uh, being a good husband, being a good minister. Everything that we do for Christ should be done with excellence. Let me say that again. The diligence of your service for Christ, be it in eldership, be it as a deacon, be it in membership, make sure you do it with excellence for he is worthy. Now, when it comes to looking at deacons, the word deacon, of course, comes from the Greek word diakonos. It is a, it is a transliteration from the Greek to the word deacon. And deacon is simply a servant. I see simply, can I say, it's such a majestic word. You see, in the first century, there were uh, they say in the Roman Empire there were 70 million slaves. Uh, the Roman Empire had the, the, the emperor and then you had the senators and the governors and the centurions and the captains. And guess who was at the bottom of the pie? Slaves, servants. But slave was the word. But what gave dignity to servitude is who we serve. And said the Lord, said the Apostle Paul, I serve the Lord Christ. My friend Deacon, you are so honoured to serve the Lord. However, uh, as we come to this portion of Scripture, just let's look down. It gives to us a list. And sometimes when we read these lists, we feel so unworthy. Let's remember this, my friend. God has not called you because you're perfect. All of us have got flaws. And we know, we know and are aware of our flaws. But he's perfect. And, and he knows what he is doing. And therefore, we can trust him. However, looking at these uh, uh, duties, as it were, in the church, in the home and in the world. First of all, uh, in verse 8, it reminds us of what the deacon should be in the church. First of all, he must have a respectful walk. Look at what it says in verse 8. Likewise, uh, must the deacon be grave? Now, that word grave is nothing to do with uh, looking solemn. Uh, we don't have to go around with tombstones in our pocket and uh, respect to undertakers, but looking uh, like you're the, the undertaker. No, the word grave is really the word in, of, of integrity. You must have integrity. Who can ever trust a leader who doesn't have integrity? What does it say in verse 8? Uh, not double-tongued. Uh, not given too much wine. There's not just that sense of uh, integrity, the sense of uh, honesty, the sense of uh, sobriety. Not given to wine. My friend, can I say that... Uh, uh, it's another subject altogether, but I don't think that the man of God who ministers in the house of God should be one who should be taking off of alcoholic beverages. It, it pickles the mind, it destroys the body. It's another subject, but
Well, I'm just quoting what the Apostle Paul says, not given to much wine. I know that elsewhere in this epistle it says to Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. And if you've got to take medicines, that is another thing. But drunkenness and the behaviour that goes with drunkenness, my friend, can I say it's anathema to the scriptures in my point of view. However, it's not only speaking here that we've got to uh, be respectful in our walk. We've got to be restrained in our talk. What does it say in verse 8? Not double-tongued. Double-tongued reminds us of, of the serpent, <laughs> the two tongues, the fangs of a, of a serpent. There is nothing will destroy the reputation of a deacon in a church uh, more than, than backbiting or uh, speaking in a slanderous way. It reminds us in verse 11, their wives must not be slanderers. Uh, that, my friend, to be tail-bearing and telling things that are not helpful to the Church of Christ. Uh, and therefore, this, this reminds me, we've got to be respectful in our walk. We've got to be restrained in our talk. And as I say, those qualities are marked by honesty, sobriety and integrity. Not only restrained in our talk, but we've also got to be, be reverent to the word. Remember we said we're servants of Christ, we're serving the church. Now the role of a, an elder is to, he must be apt to teach. A deacon also should be in the word. Uh, the Bible reminds us in verse 10, or verse 9 rather, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. When it speaks of the faith here, it's speaking of the body of truth. Therefore, a deacon should be in his Bible, know his Bible, be able to counsel from the scriptures. Although you are given to the business of the church, uh, it is, my friend, why over there in um, Acts chapter 6, where we have deacons who were appointed for the first time. Peter and others were busy preaching, but also serving tables. And Peter said, it's not good that we should be serving tables. Let's appoint deacons, as it were. And therefore, Stephen, Philip and others were appointed. And Peter said, so that we can give ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of the word. Those deacons were to relieve the burden of the church and do the business of the church. But... Stephen went on to preach. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was the first martyr and influential in the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Philip, Philip became an evangelist who evangelized an African who took the word of God back to Ethiopia. My friend, you just never know when God opens another door for you. But in this door, I say, be familiar with the word of God. That is, reverence the word. Respectful in your walk, uh, restrained in your, your words, uh, but also be in the Word of God. It is important to know the Word of God. And as opportunity comes, why God may open a door for you in that way. Uh, look at verse 11, if you would. Verse 10. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Uh, this is the sense of being reliable in your work. Use the office of a deacon. We thank God in our churches for, for godly secretaries who are diplomatic. It takes a lot of diplomacy sometimes to be a secretary. Uh, thank God for faithful uh, treasurers who have got integrity. The scriptures say here they don't have a love of, for lucre, for money. Uh, they're not taken up with covetousness. That is important. They, they are, as I am underlining here, they are reliable in the work. They're doing their duties. That's the work of a deacon. And therefore, it may be, uh, may be in the treasury, it may be as a secretary, it may be as a greeter at the door. Nowadays, we can't give a handshake or a hug. But you know something, a lot can be told by a, a smiling face, a welcoming face. 
The scriptures remind us here that we are to be good hosts given to hospitality. And hospitality is not just baking buns and cakes. It is that sense of welcoming people, not only opening your home, but opening your heart. When a stranger comes, make sure that they are made welcome. The work of a deacon. Can I say something else about him? He's got to be a good ruler in his home. Now, when I speak of a ruler, I'm not speaking of a potentate who dictates everything in his home. But the scriptures remind us here in verse 11, let the, the sorry, verse 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling children and their own houses. A lot of people take in an interpretation of deaconesses here, but we're not going down that road. And personally, I don't think that is the sense. But when it speaks here of ruling his own house, it means, my friend, to be a good husband, to be a good father. If you're going to be in leadership in the church, it's got to be reflected in how you lead in your home. Now, when it comes to uh, ruling their children, can I say that ruling of children is something that progressively diminishes? That is, as our children grow up and get into those teenage years and then beyond teenage years, we are not any more responsible for them. They're not under our jurisdiction when they're not under our, our roof, as it were. But while those children are young, how important it is to train our boys and girls. What well, happened to Timothy? His mother and his grandmother taught him the Holy Scriptures and that led him to faith in Christ. What a wonderful thing it is. A deacon, uh, respectful in his walk, restrained in his word, reverent to the, work, uh, to the word, reliable in his work, ruling well in his own home. Can I say something else? This According to the scriptures, look at verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. My friend, here is a man who is recognised in the world. I often used to say to folks in Banbridge, Wherever you go as a member of this church, you represent this church. You take the testimony of this church. If people look at you, they're seeing Banbridge Baptist Church. Can I say to you, Limavadi, where you go, you take the testimony of Limavadi Baptist Church. And what you are should reflect what the church is on the inside. Therefore, I'm asking you, are these qualities to be found in you, in the way we walk, in the manner in which we talk, I'm not speaking about accents, uh, I'm speaking about being wholesome in our talk. Are we restrained in our word? Are we given to the work of God? Are we known as people who are Bible people who are in the word? Oh, I say again as we come to look at the church, and I pray for your church that God will richly bless you, and you deacons. Uh, can I take those words again? Thank God for the dignity of being a deacon. It's a wonderful thing. Pray to God for the grace to be able to discharge your duties. And that's an important thing. You see, the man who is reliable is going to be regular at the church. The deacon who will be reliable I think it is a bad thing, a difficult thing, when there's activity on the church, the church prayer meeting. If for some reason that's okay, but I think a deacon should be at the prayer meeting. I think deacons should be at the Lord's table. They've got to be regular in their attendance. They've got to be uh, reliable in their duties. Pray and ask God to give you grace for the duty. Praise him for the dignity. Pray for grace for the duties. Can I just say, be diligent 
in executing your office, so that you may, as it says here, uh, gain for yourself, purchase for yourself, buy for yourself a good degree. Why? Because one day, we who are responsible now for what God has called us to will be accountable then. Remember I quoted over there 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, other foundation can no man lay, save that which is laid. It goes on to speak of the works that we do on that rock in the church of Christ. As we've seen it here, the, the house of God, the life of God, the truth of God. That's the church. All that we do on the rock, on that day at the judgment seat of Christ, the works that we do will be tried. And what does it say? If our works amount to wood, hay and stubble, that which was done hard, half-heartedly, or that which was left undone, the things that we do didn't cost very much. Wood, hay, stubble, the Bible says they'll be consumed. But my friend, what a day it's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. If we are able to press into the nail-pierced hand of our Saviour some precious stone, gold, silver, precious stones for the work that we did and hear the saviour say well done thou good and faithful servant <laughs> listen to it well done thou good and faithful deacon enter thou into the joy of thy lord deacons elders members may god bless you each one thank you for listening